So this is a response video to Swan Sono's The New Iliacum Typological Argument for the Papacy video on YouTube. This is the big kahuna four hour video that I'm responding to, not the shorter ones he's done. I'm going to assume that anyone who is watching this is already familiar with Swan's argument, so I'm not going to reiterate it in its fullness. I'm only going to address the relevant portions that my argument responds to. Anyways, let's get right into it. Swan essentially argues that the connection we see between Matthew 16, 19 and Isaiah 22, 22 is ultimately typological, such that it is more expected with the papacy being true than on its negation. So the argument is an inference to the best explanation. To support this, he argues over a total of eight premises that are divided up in three phases of the argument. So let's skim over the argument. Premise one, I don't take issue with this, with this premise as most Protestant scholars agree with it. It just says that there is a textual allusion between Isaiah 22, 22 and Matthew 16, 19. Premise two through six, I'm going to grant for the sake of argument, though some of what I will say later will have implications on some of the content in these premises. So throughout premises two through six, Swan lays out criteria for what constitutes as an illusion, what constitutes typology. I take no issue with any of this. Premises seven through eight, though, are what I take issue with and will be responding to. I will also respond to his later anticipated objections number two and three. So here's everything laid out. Premise seven, the textual allusions being a Peter Iliacum typology is much more expected on the hypothesis that the papacy is true than on its negation. Premise eight, if the textual allusion is probably a Peter Iliacum typology, and this is much more expected on the papacy hypothesis than on its negation, then the textual allusion strongly favors the papacy hypothesis over its negation. And the later anticipated objections two and three are as follows. Two, a posteriori, there isn't verification beyond Matthew for this typology or its significance. Uh, objection three, the other disciples possess the keys. So my responses to premises seven through eight, objection two and three, all kind of bleed into each other at certain points. So essentially what I'll be critiquing is this idea, this idea that uh, the typological model Swan lays out is more expected on the papacy than its negation, and that it is actually fulfilled in Matthew 16 and beyond. I plan on arguing against all of the above in four sections. Section 1, Jesus, not Peter, is the antitype for Iliacum. Section 2, we don't actually see Swan's typological model fulfilled in a way that rules out its negation. Section 3, Conceptual problems with Swan's typological model in comparison to other simpler models. And section four, addressing specific passages that Swan uses as evidence for the papacy. If you only take away one thing I say in this video, or two things, I strongly suggest you pay attention to stages two and three, as I think these present the most problems for Swan's argument. Indeed, I think two is decisive. So Swan spends most of the video sketching out a theoretical model that shows a typological connection between Iliacum and the concept of the papacy. The key part of this being a theoretical model. By theoretical model, I mean he shows conceptual similarities between the office of Iliacum and the office of the papacy. But note, there is a difference between a theoretical model and whether that model is actually fulfilled in history. This is an important distinction, and it is indeed fatal, in my opinion, to Swan's argument, which I'll address later. Uh, moving on. So he argues for a Iliacum Peter typology, indeed saying that Peter is, quote, the new Iliacum, but only mentions in passing that there is a typological connection between Iliacum and Jesus. So one has to wonder just how much of a typological connection Swan believes there is between Iliacum and Jesus and what the implications that would have on Swan's argument. So with this, I want to get into section one of my response. Section one, Iliacum is Jesus, not Peter. Swan argues in premise seven when addressing second order typology that, quote, God's typological predestination of salvation history suggests that anyone in a type anti-type relationship bears a significant role, end quote. The implication being that Peter is in such a relationship and thereby enjoys the, quote, significant role that follows from this. Uh, he says this at about the three hour, 30 minute and 45 second mark. So I think the first thing we should probably establish is that a very strong case can be made that Isaiah 22 is a messianic passage 
and Iliacum is a type of Christ. As I began looking into this topic and reading commentaries, even just those on Bible Hub, I began noticing that the commentators were pointing out that Iliacum is a type of Christ. And the more I read about this passage, the more this kept coming up. And even in researching some of the source material that Swan cites, it became undeniable that this passage is ultimately about Christ. In fact, the typology is more robust for Christ than it is for Peter. And it's odd that Swan doesn't really expound on this. All he really mentions is Revelation 3. But what he leaves out is all the messianic imagery contained in Isaiah 22 itself. And it's in one of the books that Swan cites called New Testament Use of the Old Testament by G.K. Beale, where I find an extensive argument for this. The entire book analyzes typology and interpretive methodology. And guess what Beale uses as a case study to show you how typology works? The Jesus Iliacum typology. He spends an entire chapter breaking down how Iliacum points to Christ. So if Iliacum is mainly about Christ, then this has major implications for how this passage applies to Peter. But it's not just Beale who says this. I found that even some early church fathers make a case for Iliacum being a type of Christ as well. And once you see this, you can't unsee it. Here's G.K. Beale, and this is only part of what he says because, again, he takes an entire chapter to go through this. I'm going to skim through this quote for the sake of time, but I'll include it in its full in the description if you want to stop the video right now and read in full. I also recommend you read his book to get the full argument. Anyway, here's Beale. Quote, Isaiah 22, 22 is a typological prophetic picture of Christ as the absolute sovereign and king of the messianic kingdom, being the final completion of what was only partially pictured through the historical figure and office of Iliacum. And here's where he goes and makes his argument. He, he, he lays out, I think, seven or eight points. Uh, I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to read some of them, though. So uh, first, one, whenever David is mentioned in connection with Christ in the New Testament, there are usually discernible, prophetic, messianic overtones. And he lists out several passages here that I'm not going to go through. Second, the reference to Iliacum as my servant, quote, in Isaiah 22:20 would have been easily associated with Isaiah's messianic servant prophecies of chapters 42 through 53, since the phrase, my servant, occurs there five times in this respect. Third, in Isaiah 22, the description of placing, quote, the key of the house of David on Eliakim's shoulder, end quote, the mention of his being, quote, a father to those in, quote, Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, and the reference to him as, quote, becoming a throne of glory, all would have facilitated such a prophetic understanding of Isaiah 22, 22, since this language is so strikingly parallel to the prophecy of the future Israelite ruler of Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. Quote, the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Eternal Father, who sits, quote, on the throne of David. As mentioned earlier, it is likely that Isaiah 22, 22 intentionally applies the language of the coming Messianic king, to Iliacum to show him as a figure who might potentially fulfill the Isaiah 9 prophecy. Fourth, that Isaiah 22:22 is viewed with a prophetic typological sense is further evident by observing the intentional allusions to prophetic servant passages, Isaiah 43, 45, 49, in the immediately following context of Revelation 3:9. So I'm going to leave this for now, and I'm going to put the quote in full, uh, like I mentioned. But uh, this is taken from G.K. Beale, Handbooked on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament, 2012. Now here's a quote from uh, St. Jerome. Uh, quote, Iliaca means God rising again, or resurrection of God. Therefore, that God rising again, who is the son of Hilkiah, that is, quote, of the Lord's portion, will take your, the Jewish law's place, and will be clothed with your robe and will be strengthened by your sash, so that what you had in the letter he possesses in the spirit. And he will be a father of those who inhabit Jerusalem, that is, the vision of peace, which means the church and the house of Judah, where there is the true confession of faith. This is why he says to the apostles, Little children, I am with you a little longer. And to another, son, your sins are forgiven. And to another, daughter, your faith has saved you. Also, I will give to him, he says, the key of the house of David who opens and no one shuts, who shuts and no one opens. And this very key will be upon his shoulder, that is, during the Passion. This accords with what is written in another passage, whose sovereignty is on his shoulder, Isaiah 9, 6. 
For that which he will have opened up by his passion cannot be closed, and what he will have closed in Jewish ceremonies no other will open. This is also why in the gospel it is written, all the people were hanging from him, like hanging from the peg in Isaiah 22, 24. Indeed, this happened not merely at the time, but it is fulfilled up to that present day that they hang various kinds of vessels from him, as if from the word of God, wisdom, justice, and all things by which Christ is designated. I think that the cups in Isaiah 22, 24 are the apostles, filled with the life-giving waters of which it is said, bless the Lord from the fountains of Israel. Um, this is taken from Thomas Schreck, translated uh, St. Jerome, commentary on Isaiah, uh, Newman Press, 2015. And here's Cyril of Alexandria, when he says, I will call my servant Iliacum. The name Iliacum means resurrection of God. Then everyone who is glorious in the house of his father will trust in him, Iliacum. Yet what is the house of Christ's father, if not the church? And who are glorious there? Those who put their trust in Christ. And they are not just those who are glorious according to the judgment of this world. On the opposite, they may be very small people according to that judgment. But God is just and unprejudiced. He repays everyone according to the measure of their, of their spiritual age, their maturity, as in that respect some are fathers, yet others are still toddlers, babies, and teenagers. Commentary on Isaiah, ancient Christian commentary on Scripture, Isaiah 1-39, through Steve McKinnon, Thomas Oden, 2014. And I have more quotes and needs from other scholars on the topic. Um, they all affirm uh, the same thing mentioned above. The point being, this passage is clearly about Christ. So why does all of that matter? Well, again, Swan says in premise 7 that, quote, God's typological predestination of salvation history suggests that anyone in a type-antitype -type relationship bears a significant role, end quote. So it matters because we need to find out who exactly has this type-antitype -type relationship with Iliacum. The implication from Swan is that Peter is in such a relationship and thereby enjoys the, quote, significant role that follows from said relationship. But what if Peter is not in this relationship? So to get more clarification on the typology in Isaiah 22, I actually emailed Dr. Timothy Rucker, whom Swan cites in his video as having written the, quote, most comprehensive paper on the Isaiah Matthew illusion. In fact, this is what Rucker got his PhD on. So if anyone has deep insight into this illusion, it's Rucker. And surprisingly, after I sent him a link to Swan's four hour video, he watched it in full and got back to me with his thoughts. And here's what he said. Quote, typology occurs on a spectrum in the Bible. It is strongest and one can potentially have license to push interpretational boundaries for the connection when typology ultimately refers to Jesus as the antitype. When a type is not the antitype, then non-Godman limitations will often hinder some potential further implications. For example, Swan uses the example of Jesus being the new Moses. Jesus is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, and the Moses typology finds its strongest fulfillment in him because he is the antitype. However, there are several types of Moseses in the Old Testament. Both Joshua and Samuel are types of a prophet like Moses to some extent. Even more so, Jeremiah is a prophet like Moses in the following ways. Both Moses and Jeremiah make excuses that focus on their incompetent speech when called by the Lord. The Lord assures both of them that he will be with them. Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is individualized to Jeremiah and Jeremiah 1.9, especially the part, I will place my words in his and your mouth. Uh, Deuteronomy 18.19-22 is a necessary interpretive lens for Jeremiah's interactions with other prophets. In the book of Jeremiah, uh, both Moses and Jeremiah face constant criticism and opposition from, quote, God's people. Both Moses and Jeremiah act as intercessors and mediators for the people. Both Moses and Jeremiah feel as if they would rather die than continue in their role. Both Moses and Jeremiah have a 40-year ministry and both die outside the promised land, assuming that Jeremiah dies in Egypt. In other words, Jeremiah is definitely a type of Moses and typology is clearly happening. However, Jeremiah is also clearly not the anti-type. God tells Jeremiah to intercede no longer for the people and Jeremiah ends up being forcibly led out of the promised land by the people toward the end of his ministry instead of leading the people to the edge of the promised land. All of that to say, sure, there is some level of typology between Eliakim and Peter because of the keys. 
However, I would place it more on the Joshua Samuel level of the typology spectrum instead of the anti-type level for interpretation. Furthermore, <clears throat> and more importantly, Jesus is the obvious anti-type of Iliacum in Revelation 3, 7 through 8. Peter is simply a type and rightly fades from view. And this fact should constrain all typological interpretation between Iliacum and Peter. It's all about Jesus. It will always will be. Peter would not want it, he would not want it any other way. Therefore, to use Swan's terminology, I focus more on the quote, similar function of the keys in my own book than on a quote, Peter Iliacum typology, end quote. That's Rucker. So the point he's making is that if Jesus is the anti-type, then this will entail there are a priori limitations regarding how we are to import this passage onto Peter. Peter seems to be typological of Iliacum in the same way that Jeremiah is of Moses. Yet nobody would say that Jeremiah is the anti-type of Moses. He's only a type of Moses in a minor sense. But Christ is the anti-type in the fullest sense. So in premise 7, when Swan says, quote, God's typological predestination of salvation history suggests that anyone in a type-anti-type relationship bears a significant role, end quote. The assumption here being that Peter is in the type-anti-type relationship with Iliacum. But this would be false according to Rucker, as Jesus is the anti-type of Iliacum and in the type relationship with him, not Peter. So while we're discussing Rucker, I want to offer you his view of Peter's role regarding the Isaiah 22 illusion as an alternative to Swan's. This will be a competing model. And we'll use this alternative in comparison to Swan's uh, later in this argument as we compare both of them with the data. This is taken from Rucker's PhD uh, paper on the illusion. Quote, Matthew 16, 19 alludes to Isaiah 22, 22 to indicate that Peter will have a key role in the establishment of Jesus' assembly among the people of God, the Lord's temple. Peter, not the Sadducees and Pharisees, will occupy this leadership role in manifesting the inbreaking of the kingdom of the heavens among the people of God. Peter is seen as the initial and unique rock upon which the Messiah's assembly is built. This assembly will be God's temple, that is, the location of God's present, worship, and victory. And he has uh, scriptural citations here. <clears throat> Finally, Matthew 16, 19 alludes to Isaiah 22, 22, in order to emphasize the door opening power that the teaching authority of Peter has for the inbreaking of the kingdom of the heavens among the lost sheep of Israel. The Jews remain God's beloved people, and Peter's mission and teaching about the Jewish Messiah will prove foundational for many more Jews to do the will of God on earth as it is in heaven, end quote. That's Rucker's model. So to summarize, all his model says is that one, Peter will have a key role in establishing the church, he is the initial rock that Christ builds upon. He is even, in some sense, a replacement of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Two, Peter will be given door-opening power via the keys of his teaching. Nothing here affirms the papacy. Now, you might object to how simple this model is by saying, well, what about all the facets of Iliacum's office that Swan went into such great detail about? Well, again, if what Rucker is saying is correct, that Christ is the antitype for Iliacum, not Peter, then there's nothing that necessitates importing all of those facets that Swan lays out onto Peter. Peter is not the anti-type. He is only a type in a limited sense. Therefore, the similarities are modest at best. Whereas with Christ, they are fuller. Plus, as we are about to see, we don't actually see those things fulfilled in Peter to begin with. This is why the distinction between Swan's theoretical model and whether that theoretical model is actually fulfilled matters. Section 2. Swan's typological model is not actually fulfilled by Peter in the New Testament data. Back to Swan's argument. Premise 7. The textual illusions being a Peter Iliacum typology is much more expected on the hypothesis that the papacy is true than on its negation. Premise 8. If the textual illusion is probably a Peter, I Peter Iliacum typology, and this is much more expected on the papacy hypothesis than on its negation, the textual illusion strongly favors the papacy hypothesis over its negation. Objection to. A posteriori, there isn't verification beyond Matthew for this typology or its significance. 
Since Swan's entire argument rests on the premise that this typology is more expected by the papacy being true than its negation, then we need to see that its fulfillment in scripture shows characteristics that are unique to the papacy and not its negation. In other words, if Swan argues that this typology is uniquely papal, then its fulfillment should also look uniquely papal. It's not enough to show some theoretical similarity between Iliacum and the papacy. What you have to show is that this similarity is fulfilled by Peter in the New Testament data. Thus, we need characteristics of fulfillment that are unique to the papacy and not its negation. But we do not see characteristics of fulfillment that are unique to the papacy. The characteristics we do see are compatible with views that negate the papacy. Thus, Swan's model does not have the consequent text it needs to show that it is actually fulfilled. And Swan does say that typologies require these consequent texts of fulfillment. Aside from Matthew 16, Swan only briefly defends the fulfillment of his model and his anticipation to objections too. And I'm surprised he spends as little time as he does here because it's so important that Swan show that his model actually lands in the real world. Again, we need to see fulfillment, not just the model alone. Okay, so let's take, take a look at the most obvious text that Swan claims as a fulfillment of his model. Matthew 16, uh, 17 through 19. So remember, what we are looking for here is fulfillment that is unique to the papacy, or at least is uniquely predicted by the papacy. Uh, so here's the passage, quote, And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. End quote. Okay, so what about this passage is uniquely predicted by the papacy? Uh, looking back at Rucker's model, all of this is consistent with what he sketched out with Peter having a key role in establishing the church, being the initial rock that Christ builds upon, and being given door-opening power via the keys of his teaching. Nothing here in this passage is unique to the papacy. Even the Orth Eastern Orthodox model is consistent with this passage. Thus, there's nothing in this passage that we can see that indicates Swan's model being fulfilled to the exclusion of its negation. So moving on. In Objections 2, Swan ends his defense of the fulfillment of his model by providing only two quotes. Each quote contains biblical references, and they are as follows. Quote, Key symbolize the authority to open. To thee relates this promise to Peter alone. It refers to the choice of Peter as first among equals for officially opening the kingdom since Pentecost, including the whole sphere of Christian profession, to the Jews and Gentiles, several Bible verses, uh, end quote. Homer A. Kent, Matthew. Okay, first notice the language here in this quote of Peter being, quote, first among equals. This is an alternative theory that negates the papacy and also that Vatican I condemns. Notice also the line, quote, officially opening the kingdom. This is consistent with Rucker's view as sketched out earlier. It's also consistent with other common Protestant views that hold that Peter was only chronologically preeminent, i.e. he was the first, which is not the same thing as papal supremacy, which hold that Peter's preeminence is for all time. Perhaps Swan will say that he understands that this quote was from a Protestant scholar and that his only point was that the scholar affirms that, quote, Peter alone receives the promise and, quote, officially opens a kingdom. And this does entail that Swan endorses everything else this scholar says. But notice how the author ties the phrase Peter alone to Peter being first among equals. These two ideas go hand in hand. Peter is alone in that he is first among equals. All that to say is that nothing about the phrase Peter alone receiving the promise and opening the kingdom is unique to the papacy. Clearly, it's also compatible with competing models like Rutgers or the Eastern Orthodox model of Peter being first among equal. Nothing here is unique to the papacy. Now let's look at the passages cited by Kent, Matthew 13, Acts 2, 10, 15, and 14. Remember, what we need to find are passages that show typological fulfillment that is unique to the papacy, not its negation. Okay, so it's not clear what Swan thinks that these passages show that is unique to the papacy and or show the fulfillment for his model. He doesn't really address that. He just posts these passages and assumes they demonstrate a fulfillment of his model 
but doesn't actually show why or argue for this. Uh, Matthew 13 is lengthy and talks about the seed of the message of the gospel, the parable of the weeds, the mustard seed, the yeast, hidden treasure, the pearl of great price, and the parable of the net. Nothing here discusses the papacy, much less Peter. Now let's turn to the Acts passages. Remember again, Swan claims that these passages are consequent texts that show fulfillment of his Iliacum typological model. So what we are looking for are characteristics in these passages that are unique to the papacy and not its negation. So in these passages, what we have is Peter as a leader, Peter preaching, Peter receiving a vision from God that explains to him that he is now to open the doors to the Gentiles through his preaching. And the final citation, Acts 14, isn't even about Peter. It's about Paul and Barnabas. So again, it is not clear what Swan thinks is unique to the papacy in these passages. All right, let's dive in. Is Peter being leader unique to the papacy? No, this is consistent with Rucker's model, which holds Peter as the initial leader. Is Peter speaking up and preaching unique to the papacy? No, again, for the same reasons. Is Peter having a vision and being chosen by God to be the first to preach to the Gentiles unique to the papacy? No, again, because even Rucker's model holds that Peter would have a door-opening power via the keys of his teaching. And here we see Peter opening the door to the Gentiles through the keys of his teaching. So nothing here shows any typological fulfillment that is unique to the papacy. Indeed, there is much here that affirms or is at least consistent with its negation. Now let's move on to his next quote. Quote, the first half of Acts discloses, discloses that after the ascension, through his relationship to James, the Lord's brother remains unclear. Peter was the undisputed leader of the youthful church. It was he who presided over the choice of a successor to Judas, who explained to the crowd the meaning of Pentecost, who healed the lame beggar at the temple, who pronounced sentence on Ananias and Sapphira, and who opened the church to Gentiles by having Cornelius baptized without undergoing circumcision. He was to the foray in preaching, defending the new movement, working miracles of healing, and visiting newly established Christian communities. Arrested by Herod Agrippa I, he was miraculously released from prison. At the Council of Jerusalem, he successfully championed a liberal policy towards Gentiles. It was from Peter that Paul sought information about Jesus after his conversion. And although he felt obliged to rebuke Peter at Antioch, the context suggests the respect in which the respect in which Paul held him. Although Paul described his ministry as directed to Jews, Peter was also prominent as a missionary in largely Gentile areas like Corinth and Asia Minor. Early tradition, perhaps relying on the visit mentioned in Galatians 2, connected him with Antioch, claiming him as this first bishop. bishop. J. N. D. Kelly, Oxford Dictionary of Popes. Okay, so do any of these passages show fulfillment that is unique to the papacy, or is Swan simply just eisegeting that onto these texts? Some of these we previously addressed in the prior slide, so we'll address the ones we haven't yet looked at. And again, it's not clear what Swan thinks is unique to the papacy in these passages. This is something he should have spent more time defending, in my opinion. Is Peter presiding as leader over the replacement of Judas unique to the papacy? No. Rucker's model holds that Peter is the initial leader. Is Peter explaining the meaning of Pentecost, healing a beggar, and pronouncing sentence on Ananias and Sapphira unique to the papacy? No, again, for the same reasons above. Uh, all of this is consistent with Rucker's view, which holds Peter being initial leader. And also opening doors through the keys of his teaching. This is all stuff that Rucker says, and this is what we see. Is working miracles, visiting new church communities, being arrested and miraculously set free unique to the papacy? No. Paul likewise did all of the above. Now, did Peter alone successfully champion a liberal policy towards the Gentiles? No, that's a mischaracterization by Kelly. Uh, it was a conciliar effort accomplished by several apostles, including Paul and James. Is this unique to the papacy, though, this conciliar effort? No. Even Rucker's model and the Eastern Orthodox can grant Peter playing a role, even a key role, in a conciliar ruling. What about the line about Paul seeking Peter to learn about Jesus? Paul seeking information from Peter about Jesus in Galatians 1.18 is another mischaracterization. Many scholars say that the connotations of this, of this visit were not like that. Paul did not go to learn about Jesus from Peter. Even Catholic theologians like Charles Callan say, quote, 
Hence, this visit of Paul to Peter was out of respect for the head of the primitive church, as all the fathers have understood, for only a short visit, not long enough to be instructed in the teachings of the gospel. From the phrase, I tarried, i.e., I prolonged my stay, it would seem that Paul remained longer with Peter than he had intended, another proof that he did not go up to Jerusalem to learn his gospel. End quote. Charles Joseph Cowell in the Epistles of St. Paul. I'll include other quotes about the nature of this visit in the description. Is Paul's implicit respect for Peter regarding his rebuke unique to the papacy? No. It's also consistent with Paul respecting Peter as the early leader of the church, which both Protestants like Rucker and Eastern Orthodox can affirm. Is Peter going on missionary journeys or being the first leader of Antioch, according to tradition not really fulfilled in scripture, is this unique to the papacy? No, again, Paul went on missionary journeys. And Peter being the first leader to establish the Antioch church, this isn't exclusive to the papacy or unique to it. Both Protestants like Rucker, again, and the Eastern Orthodox can affirm this. So this ends Swan's defense of the fulfillment of his typological model. Nothing here affirms the fulfillment of his model that is unique to the papacy and not its negation. Thus, if his typological model is not actually fulfilled, then his argument does not go through. Now, what if Swan wants to grant that, sure, uh, he can't find explicit texts that support the fulfillment of his model, but then he wants to say he can find support for it outside of Scripture, say, in the early church fathers. All I will say to that is that would seem very anachronistic to hold to a model of typology that predicts a type in Scripture, but does not also contain its fulfillment in Scripture. This is not the case for the Eliakim Jesus typology, that is fulfilled in Revelation 3. You see that typological relationship fulfilled in Scripture. So why wouldn't you see the same thing with the Peter Iliaka model? That's a huge bullet to bite for me. Well, what if Swan wants to say, well, I'm not saying that other views do not necessarily predict any of these passages. I'm just saying that the papacy predicts them in a stronger way. What well, I have to ask him, well, predicts what? That Peter was a leader, he opened doors through the keys of his teaching. This is just to restate the same problem I already highlighted. In what way does the papacy predict these passages in a way that is unique to the papacy and not its negation? Again, as I've argued, it's not like these passages are surprising on alternative views like Rucker's. So in what way does Swan's model predict this data in a way that is stronger than alternative views? Again, I just think that he's just restating the original problem. So in summary, it seems to me that while Swan does get his argument on the table, what we don't see, though, are reasons to think that his model pushes all the other models off the table, such that only his model stands as the one that uniquely predicts these passages. You don't see that happening at all. Therefore, until Swan gives us good reasons to think that these so-called consequent texts are unique to the papacy and not its negation, then his argument does not go through. Section 3. Conceptual Problems with Swan's Typological Model as argued in section two, in order for Swan's argument to work, it needs to show fulfillment in a way that is unique to the papacy and not its negation. But the texts he appeals to do not show this, thus his model does not succeed over its negation. In this section, I will offer additional reasons that Swan's model does not succeed over its negation. This will concern the conceptual issues with Swan's model versus alternative models. The papacy is complex. And because Swan's model contains the papacy, then his model is complex as well. The alternatives, like Rucker's, are more parsimonious with the data and therefore should be preferred. Now, I've stolen some of what I'm about to say from a friend, and I don't care. Because he worded it so well that it's easier to just plagiarize it. Thank you, Jeremy Kidd. We sometimes wonder if people realize how complex and robust the doctrine of the papacy really is. When one is pr presenting an argument that is based on an inference to the best explanation like Swan is, one of the central criteria for evaluating competing explanations is their degree of simplicity. The papacy is far from simple. It isn't merely claiming that Peter had successors to some degree. It's claiming that Peter's office is successional in perpetuity and that it alone carries Peter's charism while the other apostolic offices do not. For example, why don't those who succeed Paul carry his charism or James or John? Why does only Peter's successors who carry the charism of their master? And also, where is this in Matthew 16? What about supremacy? The papacy claims that only Peter's successors can lead the church, and that the successor of Peter isn't simply the older brother 
who sometimes asserts his authority. It's more complex than that. Vatican I says that the Pope enjoys immediate and universal jurisdiction. This makes the Pope more into a monarch than a brother. And by the word immediate, what is meant is that the Pope can assert his authority without having to mediate or go through anyone else. In other words, he is not required to consult anyone, even the bishops. Where do we find this in Matthew 16? It seems like another complex assumption that's being loaded onto the passage. Or what about infallibility? The papacy doesn't claim Peter's successor is infallible in the same way that Peter is. No, it's claiming something different. It downgrades Peter's infallibility, which had a positive component to it, and replaces it with a negative component, in that the Bishop of Rome is infallible only insofar that God keeps him from error, but not infallible when it comes to inspiration. Notice that this infallibility only extends to doctrine, not practice. We are told that this infallibility only prevents heterodoxy, but not heteropraxy. It only prevents error regarding doctrine, but not practice. So the Bishop of Rome will be infallibly protected from teaching error, but not protected from, say, causing the church to do immoral things, or moving the entire papacy to France for seven years like you saw in the Babylonian exile. No, infallibility does not protect from that sort of thing. And not just this, it protects from doctrinal error only in one specific way, when the doctrine is delivered ex cathedra. Which, by the way, even the ex cathedra qualification seems to be introduced to save the theory from falsification. The Catholic says Peter and popes are infallible on faith and morals. Protestant says here's a case where the pope spoke on a matter of faith and morals, where even the Roman Catholic Church now seems to recognize they were in error. Catholic says, well, they're only infallible under very specific conditions, conditions which have arguably hardly ever been satisfied in practice. According to Catholics like Swan, all of these assumptions are contained in Matthew 16. But Matthew 16 is underdetermined, so we have to read this onto the passage because this can't be drawn out. And then Swan loads all of these assumptions into his typological model. So when it comes to discovering best explanations of the data, the Roman doctrine of the papacy, and by extension Swan's typological model, smacks of tremendous complexity, not to mention a high degree of ad hocness. And that should count against it, especially by comparison to simpler models like Rucker's. With Rucker's model, there's no added assumptions about only Peter's successors being allowed to lead, no shift in infallibility, nothing about the Pope presiding in Rome, no ex cathedra statements, no assumption of infallibility of doctrine but not practice. Rucker's model is also consistent with all the texts Swan appeals to as consequent texts. And it makes better sense of the historical data as well, which seems to indicate that the papacy was a development, not a divine right. Rucker's model is just simpler overall. Peter is a key initial leader, and he's been given door-opening power via the keys of his teaching. That's it. Now, there's more that can be said about alternative models here, but for now, I am just comparing Rucker's model as an example, and only in relation to Swan's argument. The Eastern Orthodox model is also on the table, which can be explored by anyone interested. The point being is that Swan's model is too complex, and alternative models are more parsimonious with the data and therefore to be preferred. So while we are looking at the conceptual problems of Swan's model, let's also look at how it is being applied to Peter and analyze the differences between Iliacum and Peter in the New Testament church. Let's see how Swan's application of his model stacks up with what we see in Peter and the New Testament church. Swan argues that Iliacum's key, which opens and shuts, is indicative of infallibility. Okay, we can grant for the sake of argument the key is representative of infallibility and that in some sense carries over onto Peter. But notice, unlike Iliacum, the, P's, the keys are not unique to Peter. Unlike Iliacum, who is singular, Peter has 12 other co-regents who also have the keys. Not only this, but the 12 other co-regents also in, operate infallibly, whereas Iliacum acts alone. So at this point, we are watering down the similarities between Peter and Iliacum. If God really is intending to rebuild the Davidic kingdom, he's not doing it in the same way as you see in Isaiah 22. He adds 12 other co-regents to the picture, who each have the keys and are infallible. Now, Swan then argues that even though all the other apostles do receive the keys and thereby their infallibility, which Swan grants that they have the keys in Matthew 18, but he says they do so through Peter. But it's not clear what he means by this because it's not Peter who gives them anything. It's Christ who does in Matthew 18. 
But let's say we grant for the sake of argument that in some sense they get the keys through Peter. Well, what about Paul? In Galatians, he makes the case that he is called wholly apart from the original 12, receiving his status and calling, which also implies the keys from God directly and therefore independently of the original 12. He says it is not until three years later that he even visits Peter, and he doesn't visit Peter to learn doctrine from him, as many scholars, both Protestant and Catholic, will point out, as Callan said earlier. That it's not for another decade or so that he sees him again. Um, but here's another scholar, David De Silva. Uh, quote, His authority is not dependent upon Paul's or derivative from the Jerusalem apostles, and therefore he is not ultimately answerable to them or to their position. Commenting on Galatians 2, 1 through 10, Paul has shaped the narrative thus far to show that his commission and his message came to him independently of the Jerusalem leadership and in complete dependence on God. As Paul recounts at length this private meeting between James, Peter, and John on the one hand and Barnabas and himself on the other, Paul moves to the next emphasis, namely the Jerusalem apostles' validation of his apostleship and message. Paul seeks to strike a delicate balance between, one, affirming this recognition by the pillars of the apostolic mission and message, and two, not affirming that they have authority over the same. David De Silva, The Letter to the Galatians. These are just a few quotes from many that I've come across that all basically say the same thing. Paul did not receive his status and calling as an apostle from any of those in Jerusalem. He received it from Christ himself independently and directly. And this includes the keys. Thus, it's difficult to see how Peter acts as Iliacum here, the only one holding the keys, the one who in some way authorizes others to carry the keys, or is in some sense the source of the keys by which the others have access. Paul is a giant counterexample to this picture. Now, what about succession? Here we also see a difference between Iliacum and Peter. Swan claims that Iliacum's office was successional and part of the Davidic kingdom even though his office did not exist during the reign of David, and it also ends with Eliakim himself. But let's grant that his office was successional for the sake of argument. Again, unlike Eliakim, not only is Peter's office successional, so is every other apostle's office. So unlike Eliakim, Peter is not alone in this, and Catholics affirm that every apostolic office is successional. So in summary, it seems we have now departed from the picture of Iliacum as this sole figure of infallibility and succession. The New Testament picture looks totally unlike the picture that Swan painted for us in his model. Now Swan may want to say, sure, Peter has 12 other co-regents who also have keys and are also infallible. He can grant that, and he could also say that, no, Peter is not totally like Iliacum. So then he may say, uh, even so, it's important to uh, note that Peter still has supremacy. He's supreme in that he is the guardian of the apostles. And, um, and all that matters is that the essence of the type, which is transferred onto uh, Peter from Iliacum. But notice, we've already watered down the similarities by making infallibility in the keys something that is common to all of the apostles, something we don't see with Iliacum. He holds all of these things alone. But again, even with this idea of supremacy, I think... This is just to read Swan's model onto the New Testament. What we need to see uh, is the actual fulfillment of this model that bears characteristics unique to the papacy. Do we see this supremacy exercise in Peter in a way that is unique to the papacy? We just don't. So it seems that Swan is just eisegeting all of this onto the New Testament data. I think in summary, this is more in line with Rucker's argument earlier about Peter having, Peter having this minor typological correspondence. There are just too many differences between the office of Iliacum and the way Peter's office actually plays out amongst the other disciples in the New Testament. Swan cannot simply force his model onto Peter and the New Testament. He has to let the New Testament data speak for itself. And since Rucker's argument is more parsimonious, it suffers none of these problems. Now let's talk a little bit more about his objection number three, where he addresses the other apostles having the keys in Matthew 18. We addressed some of this just a few minutes ago, but I want to address the quote he brings up to suggest that Peter had the keys in a unique way that the other apostles do not. Here's the quote. Quote, If possession of the keys means the power to bind and loose, then one may urge that Peter has promised no more than the other disciples. For in 1818, the power to bind and loose is clearly held by the others. But if verse 19a is broader in scope, then one can make the case for Peter having a unique function. Uh, in our estimation, it is most natural to think of 19a as being ex explicated by what follows. 
To have the keys is to have the power to bind and loose. Further, 19A and 19B and C probably have to do with teaching authority. For the connection between keys and teaching, uh, see Luke and these other passages here. For binding and loosing as metaphors for halakhic decisions, see below. We, however, still insist that Peter is not thereby put on the same level as his fellow disciples. It remains true that only he is explicitly said to have the keys. More significantly, verse 19 cannot be isolated from verses 17 through 18. And in these last, Peter is spoken of in terms not applicable to anyone else. Also, it should not be overlooked that whereas in 1818 concerns the local community, 1619 is about the church universal. Hence, the authority bestowed in 1619 is implicitly wider than that given in 1818. For these reasons, then, we are not persuaded that the existence of 1818, with its more general promise of authority to bind and loose, diminishes Peter's prominence. If the power to bind and loose was also given to others, that does not entail that those others exercise their power in quite the same way as did Peter, or that they too held the keys of the kingdom, Davies and Allison. Okay. First, look at the phrase in that last line, quote, that does not entail that those others exercise their power in quite the same way as did Peter, end quote. What I would say is that, nor does this entail that Peter exercises power in a way that was papal, which again is what Swan has to show. Notice that this quote is not actually affirming the papacy, nor is it telling us precisely in what way Peter does exercise his power. All it is saying is that whatever way it was, it was not in the same way as the other apostles. But that could refer to any number of views. It could refer to Rucker's model, as Rucker affirms that Peter played a unique initial role. But that doesn't entail Swan's papal model. Further, here's what Davies and Allison say elsewhere that explains what they meant, and it's also fair to Catholics. Quote, Peter is not just a representative disciple, as so many Protestant exegetes have been anxious to maintain. Nor is he, obviously, the first holder of an office others will someday hold as Roman Catholic traditions has so steadfastly maintained. Rather, he is a man with a unique role in salvation history. The eschatological revelation vouchsafed to him opens a new era. His person marks a change in the times. His significance is the significance of Abraham, which is to say, his faith is the means by which God brings a new people into being." End quote. Davies Allison, Matthew, a shorter commentary. Okay, clearly what they said does not entail the papacy. And the point here again is that Swan needs to show that Peter's prominence was in a way that is unique to the papacy, not its negation. He can't simply eisegate his view onto what Davies and Allison are saying here. Moving on. <clears throat> okay, Swan also addresses the use of Paul as a counterexample. As some say that he looks more like a pope than Peter does. There are even passages where it says Paul, quote, teaches all the churches, which I will list shortly. But Swan's response to this is just to say that the other apostles all have universal authority because they are apostles, which I guess entails Paul exercising authority over all the churches, as we see in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 11. But then at this point, what Swan just suggested in the quote from Davies and Allison vanishes because they make a distinction between the church universal in regards to Peter and the local church in regards to Matthew 18. But now Swan is saying the apostles qua apostles have universal authority. And I have to ask, which is it? Do all the apostles have universal authority over the entire, entire church or only the local church? And if they do have universal jurisdiction as apostles, then what authority is there left for Peter to hold? At this point, the papacy is just empirically undetectable in Scripture. So again, on one hand, we are told that Peter enjoys universal jurisdiction the apostles will have it only locally in Matthew 18, but no way, the apostles also get universal jurisdiction too. They can exercise authority over all the churches, which is what you see Paul doing in these passages. Okay, so where then is the papacy at this point? It just seems to vanish, and there's no way to detect it. All right, so let's move on and focus on claims of likelihood. Swan's entire argument is an inference to the best explanation based on this typology being more likely if the papacy was true. So let's grant for the sake of argument uh, it's more likely if the papacy is true. Well, here's some things that are unlikely if the papacy were true, which by extension makes Swan's model unlikely as well. One, no fulfillment of the papacy in the New Testament, as I laid out in section two. Two, it's ambiguity in the New Testament. It's not clearly present. Why would something so important that we are to believe at our own peril be so unclear and, and, and debatable? Three, 
Paul's independence from the 12 apostles in Galatians 1 through 2, as discussed earlier. Four, Paul's teaching every church. He seems to exercise universal authoritative jurisdiction in those aforementioned passages. Five, evidence of the papacy being a development in the early church. See Jerome. See also Gavin Ortland's video about the papacy in the first four centuries of the church. Six, it's seeming ad hoc definition. Infallibility only occurs ex cathedra. Seven, popes moving the papacy to France for seven years. Why didn't infallibility protect from this? So even if we grant the premise that the typology is more likely if the papacy were true, then it counterbalances with these other seven things that would be unlikely if the papacy were true. So then it seems you just have a wash. And finally in this section, I want to address Swan's argument for why we would expect the papacy to be in Rome. Here's what Dr. Rucker had to say in response to this in our email exchange. Quote, I agree with Swan that Matthew 16, 19 alludes to Isaiah 22. Nevertheless, Swan's interpretation of this allusion is very anachronistic. He's seeking to turn Matthew into a Roman Catholic instead of allowing Matthew to be a first century Jew. His most blatant Roman Catholic anachronism is when he argues that Rome could, read, should, be interpreted as the location of Iliacum's office since the Roman Empire is the dominant world power in the first century AD. If I remember correctly, he bases his argument on a messianic figure confronting the beastly depiction of the Roman Empire and striking it down in both 4 Ezra and Daniel 7. Therefore, he argues that we should not be surprised that Peter ended up in Rome and that his Iliacum office would be established there. However, where do Jews in the books of 4 Ezra and Daniel expect the center of the Messiah's reign to be located? Hint, the same location that most Jews would have expected the center to be located. Where does Daniel face when he prays in Daniel 6.10? Where does Daniel hope to return? Similarly, similarly, in 4 Ezra, where does the Messianic figure establish his kingdom? On Mount Zion. Of course. Therefore, it makes sense for Jesus to place Jerusalem first in Acts 1.8. It is the center of the Jewish world. And it makes sense that the church in Jerusalem held precedence. Rome is part of the fourth part of Acts 1.8, the ends of the earth. Rome is an outskirt, the Kittim and Babylon. It is a place that missionaries and exiles go to, but it is not home for a Jew. It is certainly a worthy location for an outpost, but it's inconceivable, inconceivable to me that Matthew would have Rome in mind as a primary location of Peter's office when he wrote Matthew 16, 19. The only first century AD prominent Jewish interpreter that I can think of that would could be construed as claiming that Rome would become the central messianic location of God's blessing was Josephus. And he may have had some ulterior motives, end quote. So Swan's argument about Rome doesn't seem to hold up either. Section four, addressing various isolated passages used as support for Swan's model. Okay, this is my last section in response to Swan's video, and it has to do with Swan taking isolated passages and reading the papacy into them. You see him do this when he refers to certain instances where Peter is called out individually from the other apostles and then uses this as indirect support for his model of the papacy. I think his reading of these passages falls into similar problems that were brought up in section two, as none of them uniquely point to the papacy unless you eisegete that onto the passages. Take where Swan claims Peter is, quote, guardian of the other apostles in Luke 22, because Jesus singles him out to, quote, strengthen his brothers after he repents. But nothing in here indicates this. Theologian uh, William Barclay says, quote, when you have turned, he said, strengthen your brothers. It is if Jesus said to Peter, you will deny me and you will weep bitter tears, but the result will be that you will be better able to help your brothers who are going through it, end quote. William Barclay, The Gospel of Luke, 2014. Nothing here entails Peter as guardian of the apostles. And then Swan says in Mark and in Matthew, where the disciples fall asleep, that Jesus only blames Peter, as if to suggest that this is indicative of the papacy, since Jesus addresses only Peter. Well, here's R.T. France. Quote, The disciples here must mean only Peter, James, and John, who are now separate from the rest of the group. Since Peter is directly addressed, though the verbs are plural, including the other two disciples as well. R.T. France, The Gospel of Matthew, 2007. Then carrying this same line of argumentation, Swan then asks, Who does Jesus explicitly forgive in John 21? 
The insinuation being Peter alone because he was the chief representative for all the apostles as their caretaker and elder brother. So it seems unclear yet again what Swan thinks is present within this text that is unique to the papacy. Again, even if Peter was singled out in some sense as representative or leader, this is compatible with Rucker's view. So it seems Swan simply assumes that his view is there in the text to the exclusion of others, but doesn't really offer an argument for why. Conclusion. So as we've seen in the previous four sections, there are serious problems with Swan's typological model. First, in section one, we've argued that Jesus, not Peter, is the antitype for Iliacum. Not only does this entail a priori limitations for how Isaiah 22 applies to Peter in Matthew 16, it also rebuts a key premise in Swan's argument, namely premise seven, where Swan claims that God's typological predestination of salvation history suggests that anyone in a type-antitype relationship bears a significant role. But this premise is false if Jesus, not Peter, is the antitype for Iliacum. Thus, Peter's similarity to Iliacum is only modest at best. Second, in section two, we establish that unless Swan shows actual biblical fulfillment for his typological model, then his argument does not go through. This is because all typolo typologies require subsequent fulfillment in their antitypes. Swan's entire argument rests on the premise that typology is better expected if the papacy were true and not its negation. And since Swan cannot show that his model is fulfilled in a way that is unique to the papacy and not its negation, then his argument does not go through. Third, in section three, we showed that there are serious conceptual issues with his model as competing hypothesis to other models. Swan's model is complex, while other models are more parsimonious. We explored how Rucker's model is simpler, consistent with all the relevant biblical and historical data, and therefore it should be preferred over Swan's. We also showed that Swan's model is undercut in how it applies to Peter. We showed this by highlighting several relevant differences between Iliacum's, off, Iliacum's office and Peter's office with the other apostles. We also showed that even if we grant that his typology is more likely if the papacy were true, there are too many facts that render his model so unlikely that it just is a wash at the end of the day. And four, in section four, we showed that Swan's use of isolated passages to support his model are undercut. So putting these four sections together, especially sections two and three, I think I have mounted a form formidable case against Swan's typological argument. And unless and until Swan adequately responds to these points, his argument does not go through. This concludes my response video to Swan Sauna's The New Iliacum Typological Argument for the Papacy. I hope this has been helpful and I hope you enjoyed it. And I want to thank Travis Pelletier, Jeremy Kidd, Cody Nelson, Dr. Timothy Rucker, Dr. Stephen Nemesh, Dr. Gavin Ortland and Daniel Vecchio for all their help and advice. Thank you.